Hello and welcome to this week's Talking Africa podcast, where we get behind the news from the continent. I'm Anne-Marie Basada. Our weekly podcast is brought to you by the Africa Report magazine, which you can always check out online at theafricareport.com. Now this week, we're staying in Nigeria to take a closer look at the political system that is being stretched in all directions. And to answer the question, to what extent are these schisms rooted in the extreme violence of the British exploitation of the territory? Our guest panel today is Max Zillian, author of What Britain Did to Nigeria, Barnaby Phillips, author of Loot, Britain and the Benin Bronzes, and Funmi Adebayo, an economist and publisher of the Black Monologues podcast series. Today's Talking Africa is mediated by our own Patrick Smith. So perhaps we could start off, Max, um, with your own uh, reasons for embarking on this book because um you know in, in the um in the green room the virtual green room we were just chatting about the lack of nigerian history books uh, at one time and certainly no one has actually produced a book um to my knowledge that just asked that question what really did the brits do in nigeria and why and how much what they got out of it um, it is the subject of fierce debate uh, in Europe and, and Africa, never more so than, of course, in 2020 for all sorts of reasons, the pandemic, um, uh, police racism around the world and, and, and so forth. And, and, of course, this great movement to, to re-examine history uh, and for restitution. I want to, Max, you were right, right ahead of all that stuff. So what, what sparked your interest to, to delve into this subject? Because before, I think you've written uh, a couple of very solid histories of the Nigerian military and its effect on politics. What, what moved you into this arena? Sure. I'm happy to, to chat briefly about that. So th- there's really two macro reasons why I decided to write the book, What Britain Did to Nigeria. Um, to some extent, it coinciding with the racial justice and social justice unrest of last year was mm-hmm. was really incidental. <laughs> that, that, that did not motivate the writing of the book at all. I, right. I decided to write the book um, around 2017. And, and the two macro reasons I spoke about was really um, there's a great deal of British Empire nostalgia in Nigeria. So if you look at other parts of the world, a lot of formerly colonized countries tend to have negative feelings towards their former colonizer. Mm. But Nigeria is very different and in, in that it's one of the few countries in the world where people um, actually think of colonialism as a golden age. And the, the reason for that empire nostalgia is pretty obvious in that most of Nigeria's colonial history to date was written in the colonial era um, from the memoirs of British colonial officers who tended to present it as a civilizing mission. It was some kind of necessary therapeutic medicine that Britain had to administer for the good of the West African patient. So because Nigeria's um, population and demographics are so young, two-thirds of the, de- of the population being under 30 years old and so on. Um, obviously, there's really not many people in the country that have a direct experience of colonialism. So you've had um, multiple generations of people growing up, being fed on a consistent diet of, candidly, the colonizers' propaganda. Mm-hmm. So the book was really an attempt to challenge those narratives about colonialism being a civilizing mission and present a very different um, picture of colonialism that wasn't exclusively based on the colonizer's account. Right. Um, and so can you break down the, the, the various phases a bit in, in, in the book? Because the, the book starts, I guess, with the, um, well, with, with the abolitionist movement in a sense that, um, I think, I think at one point, yeah, I mean, 1770, was the the highlight of uh, the high the high point of the the slave trade. After that, 
Then there was the abolitionist movement, uh, heavily protected. Um, and then came this uh, a new wave of uh, British and European intervention in in West Africa, uh, which then sort of was a mixture of what missionaries and commercial exploitation. Uh, and, and it took another, what, 50 years before that turned into a sort of military conquest operation. I wondered if you could sort of break down those phases between the sort of the trade in people, then the trade in goods, and then the, the, the whole sort of com- colonial project. What, what triggered it? Or, or whether you think that's just, just far too simplistic. In fact, it, it, it's all very messy and it's all happening at the same time. I, I would actually say I, I, I agree with you that um, colonialism it wasn't just a, a linear path. It wasn't a linear experience. Right. Um, it, 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 to some extent, it, it was a case of slow mission creep. So Britain conquering Nigeria, that process took about 60 years to accomplish. So it started in kind of the 1850s um, with the bombardment of Lagos. But Britain didn't conquer the rest of what is now Nigeria until the, the early 1900s. But you can actually go back before the 1800s and for, for the sake of simplicity or simplifying that kind of 60 year, 60 to hundreds um, of years process, I'll break it down to three eras. The first era, um, as you mentioned, was the, the trading goods, the slave trade era. So that was prior to the 19th century. That was basically, you know, Portugal, Spain, Britain, the European powers mm. really extracting people from West Africa. Then after Britain, um, made it illegal for its citizens to engage in the slave trade from 1808, the, the focus shifted to, to economic extraction. And really, that shift was dictated by what was unfolding in Europe, which was the Industrial Revolution. Mm. So I, I know there's one argument that says that the, the abolition of the straight slave trade was done on moral grounds, stroke religious grounds. And there is some merit there in that yeah. um, Christian missionaries were lobbying for the abolition of the strict slave trade on humanitarian grounds. But there was a bigger macro industrial background to that as well, in that um, because the Industrial Revolution was unfolding, the European countries were becoming less reliant on human labor and more reliant on machine labor. And that shift also impacted their relationship with West Africa because now they needed um, economic resources from West Africa to help power the Industrial Revolution. And I'll give a few examples. Mm. So um, t- to to lubricate machines and factories in Britain, Britain needed to come to what is now Nigeria and extract palm oil. Mm-hmm. In, in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, um, hygiene standards in a lot of European countries were candidly lethal. So yep. infant mortality was very, very high. So washing hygiene and soap became absolutely essential to survival. So again, um, the European countries needed to come to West Africa to extract palm oil um, in, in order to manufacture soap. Then around the same time, the pneumatic rubber tire was invented, again, which caused the need for them to come to West Africa mm. to extract rubber in order to, to um, make tires. So I think... Um, that shift to industrial revolution was very, very pivotal um, to British intervention um, in in West Africa. And it was only really in the 1900s, after kind of the 1910s, that it it stopped being just about extraction of people, extraction of resources, and um, it became really about governance and creating political institutions. Could you give us a sense of what was going on in uh, in Nigeria at the same time as these uh, economic social changes were happening in in the West? I mean, it seems that, I mean, the Fulani Empire throughout the 19th century weakened, uh, ditto with the Benin Empire. Um, Were were the British just incredibly lucky in the way that they – they, they arrived in Nigeria in force with some uh, lethal technology, weapons of mass destru- destruction in the form of the Maxim gun, at a time when two of the biggest empires in in the territory now known as Nigeria were in decline. Do you, do you buy that 
that thesis. So that was part that, that if it had happened 100 years earlier, even if they'd had the Maxim gun, they wouldn't have got anywhere. It wouldn't have worked. What, what do you think to that? Timing w- was certainly very, very important. So um, if, if you look at the, the, the most powerful empires that existed in what is now Nigeria in, say, the 1600s, 1700s, yeah. so the Oyo Empire, the, the, its power peaked in the 17th, 18th, um, and early 19th centuries. Right. The Sokoto Caliphate power peaked early 19th century. Mm. Khan and Borno, their power peaked maybe 100 or 200 years earlier. And, and then just before Britain arrived, a jihad had broken out in what is now northern Nigeria. Right. We tend to kind of examine that jihad by just looking at the house estates, but we forget about the impact it had on the neighboring states. So what it did, that jihad, it either destroyed or destabilized its neighboring empire. So it spilled over into Kano and Borno, destabilized Kano and Borno. Right. It spilled over into Nupe, overthrew the monarchy there. It spilled over into the Oyo Empire, completely destroyed that empire and sent um, refugees flocking south to what is now Lagos and sent lots of them to um, what is now Sierra Leone. So Britain arrived kind of 50, 60 years after these formerly very, very powerful empires were really in decline. And then secondly, the other thing that helped um, Britain is that the the refugees that fled the, the, the these jihads that fled the collapse of the Oyo Empire ended up in Sierra Leone. Right. Um, undertook mission education, um, became um, really Europeanized, took European names, became Christianized as well, and then went home, um, tried to find their way home around the time when Britain was um, trying to conquer West Africa. So, so fortunately for Britain, um, one, it had an advance in technology. Two, it arrived with that advanced technology when the indigenous empires were weakening. And three, it arrived at the time when it really had indigenous allies, um, c- collaborators for want of a better term, who were willing to assist it in the Europeanization and Christianization exercise. So I think all those factors coalesced to, to facilitate the colonial conquest. Right, thanks. I mean, last question for this section, and I know historians don't like counterfactuals, but I'll just try this out on you. Um, if the Brits didn't exist, uh, many people would say around the world that would be a very good thing. Um, what would have happened in Nigeria with those movements you're talking about? If the Sokoto Caliphate was weakening at that point, um, the Benin, uh, Benin can, uh Empire was also weakening. Uh, the uh, what would have happened? Do you think, given the amount of contact these regions had with each other, that somehow someone from Benin would meet up with someone from Sokoto at at the highest level and say, you know, we there's quite a lot of things going on in the region. The French are, you know, grabbing land next door. Why don't we just pool our resources? get together and form a, a national army of kinds or whatever? I, I, is that just pie in the sky or might that have happened? I, I would say the, the two most likely ca- counterfactuals is, one, if, if let's just say Britain was for, was for some reason um, not interested in colonising West Africa, yeah, candidly, somebody else would have done it. And that someone else would, ver- was, would almost certainly have been France because France was interested and... Yeah. In a way, I should have mentioned it, part of um, Britain's motivation in kind of accelerating the colonial conquest is because they wanted to get there before the French did. So mm. most of what is now Nigeria probably would have been a French colony. And perhaps actually, maybe France would have had an uninterrupted French colony all the way across the, the, the whole of West wow. Africa. Wow. The other um, count, counterfactual is... Maybe in the area that is now Nigeria, there would have been four to six, perhaps, different countries. Ironically, maybe corresponding loosely to the six geopolitical zones that exist in Nigeria now. I actually think what would happen is you would have had maybe um, two Muslim theocratic states in the north, Kane and Borno and Sokoto, and maybe Sokoto would have advanced slightly further south. Right. I think ecology would have prevented them from advancing all the way to the south because their horses wouldn't be able to survive in the southern forest belt. Um, there would have been some form of Benin Empire, perhaps emasculated, continuing. And then in, in what is now the southeast and south-south, of course, 
they didn't really have empire, states, and kings. So you would have had a collection of loosely um, organized states or societies existing in that area. So I, so I think um, those would have been two of the most likely counterfactuals in the absence of British interest in that area. People would have moved in uh, of some some description, Brits or not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Th- thanks very much for that, Max. Um, Barnaby, um, uh, congrats on the book again. And um, maybe we could start with the sort of the ugliest bit of the book, which is uh, a gentleman, um, the, I think, co- acting consul general, a man by the name of Phillips, I guess no relation, no uh, relation. <laughs> Uh, rather arrogantly turned up on the outskirts of Benin City, uh, well, as what is now Benin City, and demanded to see the Oba of Benin and was given short shrift. I, I wondered um, if you could explain what what happened then and, and, and why this gave rise essentially to the subject of your book and the, the, the destruction of Benin and the looting of the, of the art, artwork and so on. Thanks, Patrick. Well, well, the events at the beginning of 1897, which is when this happens, are enormously contested, as as Max and Fumi will know. But the the context fits into what Max is saying, is that uh, British palm oil interests, above all, are getting more and more acquisitive and more and more determined uh, to take over the Oba of Benin's land. Um, The British establishment does not speak with one voice. It's important to say that what the palm oil traders of of Liverpool and Glasgow want is not actually what a government in in Whitehall necessarily wants. What ambitious colonial officials on the ground want is not necessarily what their superiors uh, back at the Foreign Office want either. But in 1892, a few years before this, um, British officials have coerced, tricked, convinced, duped, you you take your pick, the Oba of Benin, into signing, except he didn't actually sign, but um, uh, agree, consenting, it would appear, to some form of treaty, uh, the full full consequence of which he may not have even appreciated because it essentially ended his sovereignty. Um, And if you like, this gave the British the, the pretext five years later when their commercial interests were still not getting the access they wanted to the Obers land to take some action. But James Phillips is an overambitious, uh, in my opinion, young colonial official on the ground. His exact motives in January when he marches to the Obers uh, palace, he, he doesn't get any, anywhere near it, by the way, he doesn't get close to Benin City, uh, are still a mystery. I, I believe that he feels one of two things will happen. He'll be turned away peacefully, in which case he will have the pretext, he and his immediate superior, a man called Ralph Moore, will have the pretext to invade the Benin kingdom, which is what they had been advocating for uh, and what um, the prime minister has uh, has, uh, hitherto resisted. Uh, Or or indeed, he'll be admitted into Benin City and and the the Treaty of 1892 will be reconfirmed and James Phillips uh, would have pulled off a, a diplomatic coup and he would have extended British sovereignty. He's expecting one of those two things to happen, a third thing happens, which is that he's attacked by um, by the Obers soldiers. And again, the internal politics of the Edo Empire are extremely complex, and I don't think they were attacked on the Obers orders. Uh, there's a lot of confusion within, within the Edo kingdom at that time. It's a weakening kingdom. It has seen how ruthlessly the British deal with rival kings and chiefs in, in the Niger Delta, and they, they've known that trouble is, is coming. Uh, the British, uh, seven British officials, including James Phillips, are killed. Um, an untold number of uh, African carriers, who include many of the Saro people, who Max is talking about, Itsekeri people as well, uh, who um, tragically to us today are of no uh, diplomatic significance on either side, um, uh, are, are also killed. Two, significantly, two British men do escape. Um, and at this point, a British government, which has hitherto hesitated, uh, goes ahead with a punitive expedition. This is an affront to British sovereignty. Um, there's jokes about it in the German newspapers. It's within that wider uh, uh, context. Uh, and the British are a global superpower, and they can bring together um, uh, many hundreds of men from Cape Town and Malta and different parts of the United Kingdom in a matter of weeks. And um, so James Phillips is killed at the beginning of January, 
Mm. Uh, February the 18th, uh, the British have uh, captured the Benin Kingdom and ended uh, what might be 700 years of of, uh, of an Oba's dynasty. Uh, the palace is in flames. The Benin bronzes, um, a byproduct of, of this whole tragic process, are stolen. And, and the Oba is, is packed off to exile, dies in Calabar and never sees his kingdom again. Right. Um, after that... Um... After the death of James Phillips, I mean, what what was the process then in the British system? I mean, then they came, the telegrams <laughs> went back, yeah. uh, and 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 then a decision was quickly made: mass a military a force and revenge. Absolutely, that- a decision is, is made within a, a matter of days. I mean, the telegrams have have crossed, the wires have crossed. There is yeah. an order from Lord Salisbury, who's the Prime Minister and yeah. and Foreign Minister, to James Phillips not to go ahead with his expedition. By the right. time. Uh, by the time uh, that that has, is sent, James Phillips is already dead. Uh, so, uh, of course, this is happening over the the Christmas and New Year holiday as well. Which um, ev- even an imperial government takes a few days off over Christmas, and gentlemen need to go off and you know shoot shoot their grouse or whatever they do. And that, that Eat kind of their thing. Christmas puddings. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but once once the news of the Benin massacre, the mm. tragedy, this affront. Uh, to to British civilization and and several of the people who die are pretty well connected figures within the diplomatic and and uh, military service you know come from well known families right up to the top of the government a uh, decision is reached reached uh, with it within a matter of days and that punitive expedition is is put together with remarkable speed and efficiency um, any doubts about the 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 doubts remain about how many white soldiers to put it crudely you want on the ground mm. because mm. west africa is still a, a white man's grave in the terminology of the time there's there's an mm. understanding um of how to cure malaria but there's no understanding of how to prevent it the connection has not been made to the mosquito so there's there's a mm. knowledge that if you keep a lot of people on the ground they're going to get sick very very quickly mm. so they realize mm. that they're working to quite tight constraints but all of that notwithstanding uh, they give the command to a man called Harry Rawson, who is one of these kind of. Um, yeah, well, you can go and see his his. Um, there's a plaque to him right next to Lord Nelson in the crypt in St Paul's Cathedral, and he's a sort of, you know, he's a swashbuckling Victorian imperialist who's, you know, starred in all these tiny little wars that we, we don't even talk about anymore. You know, the assault on Zanzibar, the the, the Mweli expedition in East Africa, uh, first saw his taste of action. Um, uh, ransacking the the emperor's palace in Peking in the 1850s, um, grumbles so, in his diary at that time that he doesn't get any of the loot. Uh, he, that sounds his like the, he sounds like the Mad Mike Hoare of his age. I mean, he was a kind of rent renter renter military attack person. Well, I think I, I think was he would, for the I, I mean, <laughs> it's an interesting comparison. I think he would see his his job much. I, I would see he he would see himself as as a patriot. Um, mm-hmm. He's he's not quite for hire. He's he's operating uh, within a a sense of British patriotism, a sense of moral superiority. Yeah. Uh, he's yeah. close. He's back, he's close to the Queen. He's been the AD, the aide de camp to wow. Queen mm-hmm. Victoria. Uh, his ships carry Queen Victoria's coffin across from. The Solent, when she dies a few years later, he, right. he's, he's 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 at the heart of the British establishment. Sure. Um, incredibly popular with his own sailors, by the way. He's twice risked his life during his career um, mm. to rescue drowning sailors out of the sea. He is he is a brave man, uh, and the British are driven on by, well, a, a lethal combination of, I suppose, commercial greed and a sense of moral superiority, mm. allied. Probably in particular with with the Maxim gun, which is just an, uh, as you called it, a weapon of mass destruction. Max referred mm-hmm. to it as well, uh, a weapon to which um, the Edo soldiers, in in this case, and and other other you know the, the soldiers who tried to fight in Omdurman and all sorts of other places, discover that you know that there is no there is no answer to a machine gun which fires 10, 10 bullets a second. It's 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 impossible. And. and- after the, this was done, after the palace was raised, the uh, artworks were stolen, um, was there any within British society at the time? I mean, this was a, a time when there was an active protest movement developing in Europe against King Leopold's depredations in Congo. Was there any um, 
serious political opposition to to this colonial policy? I would say there is very little self reflection within uh, within Britain as mm. as to what has happened. I mean, I certainly the the first display of the Benin bronzes um, in September eighteen ninety seven in the British Museum. Um, I think provoked some intellectual head scratching. There's, you know, oh my God, th- these these are extraordinary objects of great beauty, great sophistication, likened to ancient Greece, likened to the Italian Renaissance. Um, but you know, Africa is a place of barbarism. It is a place of of no history is in the 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 mindset of the age. And yet, self evidently, some of the finest of these plaques have to be hundreds of years old because they display yeah. Portuguese soldiers in, in meticulous yeah. detail in fifteenth century armor. So this causes great confusion, and it's like, oh, you know, well, maybe the Portuguese themselves made them, or maybe it was some wonderful wandering tribe of Egyptians or Indians. All sorts of theories go round and round. Uh, th- th- there's another element to this, which is that Benin, in particular, has been portrayed as a place an especially barbaric and bloody place, uh, yeah. a place where human sacrifice is out of control. And, I, and I, this is one of the most difficult areas, I feel, for, for an outsider to, to write about. But there is, there is no doubt that in the specific period between James Phillips's death and mm-hmm. the British invasion, there is a panicked reaction within Benin City. And there is a spate of human sacrifice, which right. enables the British, I suppose, to justify an invasion in civilizational terms. I mean, they probably would have yeah. explained it. They would have justified it in those terms anyway. But it adds added credence to that. Uh, and there are enough. There are journalists who come along afterwards with the Illustrated London News, an extraordinary man called Seppings Wright, who's a sort of top foreign correspondent of his day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the lurid details are thrown into the picture. And I suppose they that they make it less likely that there will be some serious. Uh, reflection about Benin civilization in all its entirety, which, like any great empire, is full of contradictions, and not least the British. It's full of um, artistic achievements. It's capable of cruelty as, as well. And there's, there's, People can understand those contradictions within Europe. They can't understand those contradictions in an African civilization. Um, just as a last question for this bit of the podcast, I, you mentioned the beauty of these bronzes and the artistry and so forth. And in the book you describe, I, I think, well, half a million people troop to see them when they're displayed in the British Museum. Uh, did you sort of delve into the psychology of the average Londoner of the time who's been fed on this sort of propaganda diet of colonialism is that we're going out to sort of uh, promote British values? Um, and, and so while we're queuing up to see these incredible artworks, how how were those contradictions resolved? Do you think in the psychology of the visitors looking at these uh, artworks? Uh, that that that's a very good question, and I I searched hard for individual reactions from visitors as opposed to curators and academics who right. went to see those first exhibitions, and they are hard to find. Yeah, I find yeah. the I, I would say Patrick the to my. To my reading, the only European in these initial years who sees that the Benin Bronzes provide a direct moral challenge to, mm. to Europeans and their behavior in, in Africa at that time um, is a man called Felix von Lucien, who is a German curator. The Germans right. react with great alacrity mm. to the, the British loot. I mean, these, these British soldiers and sailors are not art critics. Um, they, <laughs> yeah. They're looking for a quick buck to, quite often. So... A lot, a lot of their loot is is auctioned off straight away in the summer yeah. of 1897. And in fact, German curators realise that there's something quite unusual going mm. on here. Um, and it's Felix van Lucien who this yeah. you know, brings us to Germany today and why, why Berlin has such an amazing collection of Benin bronzes. It's because the Germans realise uh, what exceptional pieces there are. In fact, while the British Museum is rather slow on the uptake... Um, and it's Felix van Lucien who says, well, you know, we can't we can't call these people savages, or maybe we're savages too. Uh, don't we? Can't you see the civilization and the humanity in what we've brought back? But I would say, he, uh, of course, the tectonic shifts within any society are shifting under underneath. But at the time, he is a voice in the wilderness. Right, right. And so just, oh, that process was the uh, the British troops 
looted the palace and they brought back the 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 loot to to London, but also managed to make a bit of money on the side by sending it to the Germans. Is that how it so, happened? Y- yes. So yeah. a, f- a few hundred of the plaques are, which are the sort of sp- what those bed and bronzes are are plaques. They're sort of sheet mm. the size of A three sheets of paper, as it were, and they they have right. displays on them um a few hundred are loaned to the british museum by the foreign office and are part of that first first display of september 1897 and then Uh after that they are donated to the british museum the vast majority are always in private hands um and what happens well different things happen some families keep them some families Mm -hmm. still have them by the way Mm -hmm. Direct yeah. descendants. I, I know them. <laughs> they, they won't come. I can't tell you their names, but I know them. No, I know direct descendants. Good <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, in, uh, who, who hold Benin bronzes? Mm. Um, many try and sell them straight away. Um, th- and it's important to say they don't make huge amounts of money straight straight away. Mm. Um, you know, man, uh, there's a man called Norman Burroughs, who's a lieutenant who sells off mm. to Augustus Pitt Rivers, as in the Pitt Rivers Museum. He sells right. his off very very quickly an amazing collection of benin bronzes that today you know if we have to talk about them in financial terms worth millions and millions and he makes roughly the equivalent of twenty thousand pounds in today's money which is Hmm. don't get me wrong a nice sum of money but it's not going to change your life forever as it were other families hold on to them and start to auction them off you know late 1920s early 30s you see a series of auctions um, of officers who are actually dying in in that case um, and in this way, they get dispersed. The British Museum continues to acquire new Benin bronzes right up until 1986. Mm. And it has the largest collection um, in the world today, close to a thousand. Um, but many go to Germany, many go to private museums in the United Kingdom, elsewhere in Europe. And then, of course, many end up, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, in the United States. And another fact which has to be said here, which is doesn't get said enough, is that uh, a man called Kenneth Murray, a, a fascinating British colonial official in, in Nigeria who dedicates his life to Nigerian ends, <laughs> dies there tragically in 1972. He spends much of the 40s and 50s buying up Benin bronzes, which are being sold in auctions in London, and yeah. bringing back dozens of the very finest Benin bronzes to Nigerian museums. Um oh. Uh, and which is why Nigeria does have a superb collection of Benin bronzes today, not nearly as large as Britain's or Germany's, but its museums have done a poor job at displaying them and in some notorious cases have failed to prevent their thefts either to the private market or indeed to back to prominent um, American British Museum, uh, British uh, American museums in particular. So I I feel that Mm. is an awkward fact. It needs to be said. Okay. Well, well, thanks, Barnaby. Um, Fumi, can I bring you in at at, at, the, at this point? Um, first, maybe on the bigger question before we get down to the cultural issues of the bronzes and so on. Um, his, the teaching of history um, is really come under the microscope over the past, uh, well, decade, I guess, but particularly over the last twelve months. How much history? The, of the history that you come across uh, when you, when you were going through the the educational system in, in Europe, I guess it's all in Europe, right? Um, that you uh, you kind of resiled against, and this doesn't make sense. I mean, why are they telling me this? Why? Why? What? What is being left out? Um, and I mean, and what about your peers from from that age? I mean, have in your in your mind, have the, have these questions been sort of rumbling on over the last I don't know ten twenty years, and 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 are you optimistic now with books like Max's and Barnaby's that at least we're having a discussion about what what was left out and trying to fill in some of the gaps? Yeah, um, there's a lot to unpack, but um, I just want to make a point, which is that the very idea of history. And what that means is different in different cultural contexts. We often just split it in terms of written and oral, but there's also the what keeping that history means and how that history is passed around and what lessons people are trying to take 
from the history or not. Um, I think in European circles, it's quite academic. Um, a lot of it is through the lens of, you know, this is my opinion on what they could have meant during that period of time. And there's a lot of projection, I feel like, at times. Um, and so the prism, right, which is what is coming up a lot now in terms of looking at history with a completely different lens. But the prism through which a lot of um, this history is written is from a very Eurocentric sense, Um I mean, I, I probably should have studied anthropology instead, but, you know, my dad was like, you need to make money. So I studied finance. Um, but, you know, the even European anthropologists, when they went over, you know, you're talking about them detailing or documenting cultures that they knew nothing about. And they didn't have a frame of reference to understand it either. Right. So it was just their perception of what they saw. Um an example of that, I was talking to my friend recently and I was saying how, you know, because we both have worked in Africa divisions of big multinational companies. And we, we talked about the fact that we would sit in meetings and particularly with Yoruba people, if they think that what you're saying doesn't make sense, they don't talk. It's not that they don't understand mm. what you're saying. <laughs> they just don't see the point in engaging. And it was so interesting because my British, white British counterpart colleagues would say, oh, you know, they didn't really say anything. I don't think they quite understood what we were saying. Um, and I was like, no, 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 they completely understood what you were saying. They just thought what you were saying was ridiculous and they couldn't be bothered to engage with it. Right. And so that's a very real modern example of like even today, even people who focus on Africa, who have a completely different cultural frame of reference, how they read certain social situations, right? Because they can only see it through the lens of the culture they've been imbibed in. So with that being said, right? Like, so as someone who, like, as you correctly pointed out, being Brigerian, so British and Nigerian, um, you know, understanding history or being taught history, it was very clear that the whole point of why I was being taught this was to understand the power of Britishness or of British Empire and all the great things the British Empire have done. And yes, we've done some bad things, but it's all been for the greater good. And now we're doing things to address that, um, you know, and they're, they're really, and that overarching sort of moral superiority, um, you can internalize that, you know, even as someone who, you know, I'm a second generation immigrant, um, Nigerian immigrant, but, you know, it's, you internalize the sense of, oh, well, they were the conquerors and they won, right? And look, so yeah, like what they did was bad, but they succeeded. And so maybe there's credence to the approach that they took, right? So even when they acknowledge, okay, we did some things that were wrong, there's still this sense of, but the greater good was achieved, right? Um, and I think compare that to the more anecdotal sort of tellings of history within my home, and I'm of Yoruba descent, a lot of it was around what they did wrong and the lessons that um, they feel were taken from it or needed to be taken from it. Um, some of them, you know, are imbibed in stereotypes, um, you know. So, like, I, my, like, they, a lot of particularly Yoruba people, they like to say, oh, Ibo people, they don't have respect. They don't know how to greet or, like, something silly like that, right? Or they're more industrious or that. So a lot of things would be seen through the prisms of that based on, historical situations that they would discuss and particularly growing up and being around those conversations with my older with older generations around me there would be quite a critical lens with which they would look at history and discuss history and discuss and discuss and discuss and over and over again and it's so normal 
to um, be around debate around what really happened. And it still exists today. That still happens today. And that is not something that I see mirrored, um, you know, in, in European sort of circles when it comes to history. A lot of, a lot of it tends to be, um, well, we're sure this is what happened. And <laughs> we're sure these are the conclusions out of it. But we just want to try and look at it from a different perspective. That's a very different sort of, um, you know, and I don't know if I'm really teasing out the cultural difference enough here. But um, like, it, that's very different to the sense of, OK, growing up with this sense of, OK, let's look back. What should we learn from this? And I think that comes with it being largely oral history, because at the core of oral history, which is why I have that at the core of the Black monologues as well, is that there are meant to be lessons mm. and philosophies and moral tellings that come out of it, right? It's not something to just, like, you know, chop up dice and, you know, um, come out with conclusions about which don't have a genuine um, sort of moral, um, you know, um, ideology at its centre, other than the sense of, we're just generally trying to do the right thing and the right thing, at least from my experience, particularly with the European views on approaching history, tends to be about analysing, you know, um, if they were successful or not. Right. And that's usually to do with conquering <laughs> and whether or not it's violently or economically or whatever manifestation it takes. It's always around this idea of how do we extract as much? How do we make this more productive? How do we push, 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 push in terms of economic growth or political power as opposed to, OK, how do we get better in terms of how we engage as a community, you know, culturally? Um, so for me, those those teasing out those differences, you know, it's something that happened as I grew up over time in terms of. Mm -hmm also have to unlearning this sense of you know that it's more sophisticated history if it's written down it's recorded it's detailed and you know there's this question of accuracy and I think what's been tested right now or is being tested right now particularly with people amongst my generation and this idea of decolonizing you know academia is all of the principles on which even the analysis is built out of um, what drives that? Is it an extractive thing? It is like, what, why is this? Um, because, and they say, you know, with European anthropologists, they didn't go there to try and truly understand how to be part of that culture. They try to analyze the people to understand how they could conquer them. And that's a very different way in which to, analyze situations right um and so for me um even during this conversation and listening to what's been said it's very interesting to hear how perception and you know um sort of readings of things can sort of change you know what you how you read into that situation or what you think about that situation um and i think that's a big issue that we need to start you know addressing more and i'm happy to say that my generation is trying to address more you, i mean after last year with books uh, like Max's and barnaby's um do you think we're we're, we're heading for uh, a big change i mean this i guess the, the point you're making is is both as a sort of informal, the oral history, the history that in all cultures you you learn from your family and your your parents and the whole that whole network, which is sort of like value reinforcement. However, it comes, but there's also the the academic, the formal history that you're talking. And for example, uh, there was this story that history teaching in Nigeria, many schools were suspended. I guess state schools uh, after the civil war. Uh, for political reasons, uh, but also, I mean, that would have deprived people of understanding just what the their history of the 18th and 19th century and how Nigeria yeah. emerged out of that. Yeah. 
But even speaking to that, right, for my Nigerian peers, so for example, when I was in Nigerians in the Square Mile, you know, I'm running the Young Professional Cell Group, like we were yeah. constantly talking about these sort of issues with our Nigerian counterparts who were born and bred in Nigeria. And they were saying, you know, because it's relatively recent when um, history was taken out of like, and we're talking about the secondary primary level here, right? Where history was just seen as something that you didn't have to do anymore, right? And in state schools, they're still getting taught in some private schools and you could still opt into it. But they said, even when they, learn history as in my peers who grew up being taught history it was either too far like you know we're talking about super old like you're looking at like for example if I look at Yoruba people specifically like Yoruba mythology or like Max mentioned like looking at the oil empire or looking at the Benin empire or what have you so it was so far right away um Or it was like the really recent stuff, which was all through the lens of colonialism and all of that middle part, which spans over centuries, just wasn't taught anyway, you know. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of their understanding of culture and what it means to be Yoruba or what it means to be any other ethnicity was not seen as the responsibility of the state through a structured institution like it is in Britain, right? So for my sense of Britishness, largely, and for many British people, largely comes from this sense of this was our history and this is our, you know, that nostalgia around empire, this is who we were, right? Um, Through being taught about how they conquered places or whatever they did in the past, right? Whereas a sense of, who you are and identity in terms of your culture is largely about your family history. So a lot of people will have a very strong sense of their own family history or their own community history, right? Instead of this general sense. And we also need to be cognizant of the fact that what is Nigerian history in, in a Nigerian con the Nigerian construct doesn't really mean much to people within Nigeria. Right. Particularly if you start looking back even further into history, um, Nigeria wasn't a concept. So you have to look into the specific ethnicities and how they decide that they are going to keep and maintain their sense of culture, which also changes and is fluid over time. So this is what I mean by when we try and tease out, okay, history, history is important, but what sort of history is important? Um, and what are the lessons you're getting out of it, right? Because you can look at a factual event, Mm -hmm. like you know that event happened, but you can come out with very different Mm -hmm. conclusions depending on your intentions behind what you're writing for, right? And so I think for a lot of people, history, at least from my peers, whether you're in like growing up in Nigeria or you're growing up in the diaspora, it's about understanding your sense of identity and who you are. And a lot of that is grounded in community, right? As opposed to reading in a book that, oh, this is what happened 100, 200 years ago. Right. You know, it matters, of course, but it's it's not, the importance of it is not exactly the same. And I think at times we've been so focused on trying to make sure that we detail our history, um, you know, in a written format that we've kind of missed that actually you need to bring it back to identity and what that means and what the implications are for identity, um, which I'm happy to say, at least I feel like is happening more and more. So progress, some progress on that front. Um, Max, can um, I tease out some of those things that Fumi is talking about in terms of the the value of the history, but on on a kind of national scale? I mean, uh, one of the things people talk about, apart from history as a kind of potentially as a sort of nation building exercise, giving people a common narrative. Uh, as we can see in the case of Britain and US, is often quite a false one. But um, to what extent, uh, from your your work in, in this book, what Britain did to Nigeria, 
uh, can you, do you think that students reading this are going to sort of draw lessons from this, both in terms of the kind of divide and rule ta- tactics that the British colonial uh, forces used and, and um, the economic side of that? I mean, it has been called, uh, Nigeria has been called as a transactional country or rather the project to, to push Nigeria together has been seen as, as, as like a company state uh, whatever you know, whatever the business is, that the sort of the state comes afterwards and kind of so- solidifies the contract. So you know, it was built a hundred years ago. It was built on palm oil, and now it's built on um, Shell and Exxon's oil, or rather their their capacity to get that oil out of the ground, so it make a lot of money. Um, I, I wondered to what extent you you you're looking at the lessons from your your work and, and what they're offering the students today. Sure, and, and I'm happy just to talk about a, a, a couple of dynamics that just emanate from that question. Um, yeah. First, I'll tackle the, I guess, the economic question about Nigeria being an extractive state. I would say that um, it was definitely created for extractive reasons. It was and has always been an extractive state. It's just that the identity of the extractors and the commodity that they are extracting has changed between the pre-colonial and the post-colonial era. So in, in the pre-colonial era, the, the, it was natural resources and people, uh, i.e. slaves, that were being extracted. Um, then the post-colonial era, it was still natural resources, but a different type of natural resource, um, crude oil instead of palm oil. People are still being extracted, but this time is via the so-called brain drain, via voluntary um, migration. Mm. The, the other thing I would say is that um, what has surprised me uh, since I wrote this book is the extent of surprise among its readership. So people are just absolutely astonished that um, a lot of Nigeria's contemporary problems, which they just presume somehow were organic, actually have their 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 umbilical cords rooted to events in the colonial era. And that's been a great um, surprise to me. Now, the reason for that um, surprise among the readership is obvious. We, we've talked about it. Um, Barn- Barnaby's talked about it. You talked about it. Fumi's talked about it. It's really the educational system. And the, the Nigerian educational system, in my opinion, has was never indigenized. If you go back to the colonial era and look at the architect of the Nigerian colonial um, education system, they were missionaries. Mm. Now, their objective for teaching Nigerians to read and write wasn't really educational. It was to teach them to read and write in order to facilitate their conversion to Christianity, to make it easier for them to read the Bible. Then when the colonial government started to take an interest in education, again, they had a different motivation. It wasn't really trying to create an Africanized educational system. Their motive was to educate West Africans in order to produce an indigenous workforce that could read and write, that was literate in European languages, to assist the colonial administration, because candidly, it it was cheaper to employ educated Africans than it was to employ British expatriate staff, who you had to pay a lot more, and who were invalidated for sickness because of malaria and so on, because they they couldn't stand the West African climate. So the the education... horrible. Yeah, the educational system was really, you know, designed for economic reasons. And then to, to be candid, post-colonial Nigerian governments need to take some of the responsibility as well because um, they never indigenized that that colonial-based educational system. And it, there's two reasons for that. One was the civil war. That war, the consequences of that war, I think of, I wouldn't even say it's held Nigeria back several decades. It's potentially you will not get rid of the consequences of that war, maybe for 100 to 200 years. Because it wasn't a war between countries, it was a civil war, and the way the war ended and go on with his magnanimity, understood, look, the combatants are not going anywhere. They need to continue living in the same country to build this newly independent country. You couldn't keep talking about the war because it would just continue the bitterness. So there was this kind of decision to have a general amnesty, the three R's, you know, um, kind of forgive and forget. And just the way to move on on from that war is to pretend it didn't happen. So historical discourse largely disappeared from the Nigerian educational system. And unfortunately, 
it wasn't just about the civil war. It seeped into other areas. So there was no discussion about colonialism. There was no discussion about pre-colonial empires. So just the historical discourse almost became taboo in post-colonial Nigeria. Then I'll conclude by also saying that if you look at um, other countries, let me use America as an example. Now, books and the educational system are not the only vectors for transmitting American history. I, and I, I promise what I'm going to say next, I'm not being flippant. Mm. Hollywood, one of its greatest successes is projecting a very, very romanticized idea of American history worldwide. So, um, you know, fine, cowboys, <laughs> cowboy and Indian films, it's very cartoonish, but it is a very popular way of projecting a, a, the, the kind of Wild West era of America's history to a, to a popular audience because let's face it, not everybody likes reading books, but mm. it's much easier. Um, visual media is much more attention grabbing. Now, unfortunately, Nigeria's art scene, you know, even though Nollywood, um, the, the indigenous, um, film sector, it's been very successful, but we have to remember it's, it's still embryonic. It's only been in existence for a couple of decades. So I think, um, we have to stop looking at the, the formal education sector as the sole vector for transmitting history and start using other me- media like um, film, video, audio, th- this kind of podcast that we're doing. And I, and I think really the Nigerian, not the government, because it's not the government's responsibility to do everything, but let's just say the Nigerian creative space needs to really step up and take responsibility for transmitting that abandoned history to young people via more popular media that's not just the educational sector. That's a kind of freewheeling, um, open debate about what happened in Nigeria rather than the sort of narrative you get in the US and to a lesser extent Britain about about history. I guess the the problem is what we're now discovering in the US, that a lot of... uh, the history, particularly uh, about slavery uh, and leading up to the Civil War, what happened after the Civil War in the southern states, uh, was convicted. Uh, even, well, you know, people have been talking about uh, this week, have been talking about the Tulsa massacre, race massacre. Um, that was completely suppressed. In Nigeria's case, is it possible? Are you calling for an, a kind of an open debate about history, really? Um, it would be, it would be too ambitious for a government to say, right, we need a national narrative and we're going to have uh, representatives from whatever the 380 language groups sitting down on a committee and we're going to produce a, a national da- narrative. Is, is is that appropriate or that, that would be a waste of time? What, what What's your view on that, Max? I'll say two things. Um, the first is that history is contested in Nigeria, but that's, that's not a unique phenomenon to Nigeria. Sure. History is contested everywhere. If, if you... Talk about the American Civil War. I'm, I'm pretty certain that a New Yorker and, you know, somebody from Mississippi will have very, very different perspectives on the, the US Civil War. Or right. if you talk about conflicts in Asia, a Japanese person and a Chinese person will have very different perspectives on their respective conflicts. So Nigeria is no different from that. Right. So I would say that, look, um, the hyper diversity of Nigeria, 520 or different language groups, Completely right. different cultures. The only country in the world split equally between Christians and Muslims. I, I just candidly think it's too ambitious to expect a historical consensus in uh, in what might be candidly the most diverse country in the world. Right. And I'll give you an example why. Um, after the Civil War, I'm aware that the military tried to write a military narrative of the Civil War. It was so incendiary, and they couldn't get consensus, and they killed it. They just decided, look. We just cannot produce a linear narrative of this. It just killed the project. So that's just a micro example of the, the, the challenge of producing kind of a, a revised authorized standard version of Nigerian history. So, so yes, to some extent, I am really calling for, for a, a debate where everybody brings their own perspective. I don't think that's necessarily harmful at all. That there is no kind of one truth. It's all, just all about different perspectives. Mm. To me, commencing that debate is the, the, and books like like myself and Barnaby have written, that's the start of that process. I'm not saying we need to agree, but certainly we need to to have the dialogue and at the very least acknowledge that um, 
there's some very, very, very important histories that have been neglected. And it's not just colonial history, even pre-colonial history as well. And that there's this kind of perception in Nigeria that, you know, in the before the Brits came, Nigerians were, were just this very, very primitive, illiterate, backward people. And, and that's not true at all. We, you know, Nigerian, different Nigerian societies in North and South had their own writing systems. They had very, very sophisticated kingdoms and states. They had international relations with each other. They traded with each other. And um, unfortunately, Nigerians, because of the lack of historical discourse, have bought into that um, idea of African inferiority so much that I do think that starting this debate is a way to to challenge those um, prevailing narratives. Right. Well, good. yeah, good. Let, let's hope it, it helps. Um, Barnaby, I'm kind of, the clock is running away with us, but um, it's been fascinating listening to all your uh, perspectives on this. Um, could I ask you a, a, a Benin Bronze-centric question? There's a wonderful chapter in the book uh, where you conjure up the visit of Robin Cook, the late Foreign Secretary, uh, Labour Government Foreign Secretary, visiting Lagos, uh, expecting a kind of um, you know easy ride. And uh, a bright spark uh, in the class puts up her hand and says, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, when are you going to return the Benin bronzes? Um, can I repeat the question to you, Barnaby? Not personally. I don't think you have any, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but when is Britain going to return the Benin bronzes? And if not, why not? <laughs> okay. So I, the, the slightly boring answer to that question is it's a mistake to talk about Britain as a whole. There are... Right. Uh, there's a man called Mark Walker, a retired doctor who lives on Anglesey, a grandson of Herbert Walker, who was a captain on the on the expedition. 2014, he felt uncomfortable about his inherited Benin bronzes. And he, although he'd never been to Nigeria, he said, I'm going to return my Benin bronzes. And he got on a right. he got on a plane to Nigeria and returned his Benin bronzes. Wow. Jesus College, Cambridge says it's mm. taken down, it has taken down its cockerel. It says it's going to return its Benin bronze. The University of Aberdeen says it's returning its Benin bronze unconditionally. So diff right. different museums at different institutions, individuals have their own, uh, own rules. Often people are talking about the British Museum. Um, and I, well, I guess the, the British Museum, it's complicated. It has, you know, it has as I said, that the biggest collection and, and many of the objects, I suppose, you know, curators or indeed Edo, and Edo anthropologists would, you know, would balk at this, but many of the most iconic and celebrated objects, of course, the what's known in Nigeria as, as the Festac mask itself, uh, the, the Queen Idia mask and, and, and other superb objects. It is constrained by the British Museum Act of 1963. This is the, the facile answer, which means that Parliament, unless the British Parliament changes the law, it cannot hand back deaccession. Museum curators say it, it's been in bronzes permanently until that law changes. It can it can loan in the long term, but it can't do what smaller universities can do, or indeed what German uh, German museums can do. And you then have to ask yourself if you look at this particular. British government at the moment that's in power, can you see that being part of its cultural agenda, changing the law so that colonial looted art is returned? It doesn't strike no me contrary. that it is the, the top mm -hmm. of, of Boris Johnson or, um, or Oliver Dowden's intray. Um, no. is, is the British Museum currently, under its current leadership, uh, determined and emboldened enough to take on the government and fight that battle? Uh, no, I would say, from my experience and my conversations with curators and, and maybe like many other people i i thought of the british museum as a very you know monolithic and arrogant uh, immovable object and of course it's it, like any institution that's full of lots and lots of very clever people they don't all agree with each other and it's divided right. and now with the pandemic it's financially on the back foot and more beholden than the british government mm. so so in short i don't see the british museum's ben and bronzes being returned um certainly not permanently in the foreseeable future. But I would just say one other thing, Patrick, which is that yep. we should look more and more when we're talking about the restitution, given what many other museums want to do, given what the Germans want to do, mark my words, the real politics of restitution right now are in at least as much in Benin City and Abuja as they are in London 
and Berlin. And you have the NCMM, which is the federal government. You have the yeah. Oba of Benin. And you have the governor of Edo State, Godwin mm. Obasaki. Uh, yeah. And I'm afraid, watch, the, watch that space because there are serious interests at play, as, as, as you can imagine. Um, there is a, so we, we, we'll have to see what, 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 what happens there because often I feel that they are pushing against an open door. There are enough European museums that want to give back their Ben and Bronzes mm. and see their Ben and Bronzes, frankly, as embarrassments uh, yeah. and would like, would like to make progress on, on, on this issue. Um, and so what is so exciting about the current moment is that for the first time since 1897, it is the Edo themselves, or, or if you like, the Nigerians mm. themselves, who can who have a huge say in defining what happens next, which is which was not the case until 2020. So the world has changed in that regard. And the project to build the the museum in Benin City, the David Ajay designed one, and all the rest of it. Do you see that gathering momentum? taking off in the near future uh, well and- it, it, i i i'm it, it, i refer to those three power structures and if they are yeah. all kept on uh, if they are all kept on on board um yeah. it's it's a very ambitious plan uh it, the, the 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 museum is estimated at uh, 150 million dollars in cost yeah. Um, it has been very tied to Godwin Obasaki, the governor of Edo State, mm-hmm. who, although he sure. won a second term last year, he's only there until 2024. Um, so th- things will have to move uh, quite quickly and, and divergent interests uh, would, mm-hmm. would have to be kept, kept on board for that to happen. Of course, there is, a, there is an absolute moral case. You could say, you know, the Ben and Bronzes were, were stolen. They should, you mm-hmm. know. What right does any 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 person involved with the theft uh, have to say to you know yeah. the con- the conditions quote under which they should go back? But nonetheless, yeah. that the European museums who hold most of the Benin bonds have signed up to this particular project, and keeping this project on the road, well, there are bound to be some hiccups because there's right. the serious money and politics and jealousy and rivalries. Uh, between uh, between these different polities, precisely the kinds of polities which the British played on so successfully during the during the colonial period uh, to keep the show on the road, but the the end goal is is a is a fabulous one, and I I feel that if you know if we if many of the world's Benin bronzes are returned to Benin City, that that surely would be the you know a moment of global cultural significance Un, for me i would say unparalleled cultural significance in post independence african history you could almost take it to that in within the cultural sphere in in terms of uh, you know reversing the reversing history it would be an extraordinary moment if it can be achieved 120 years after the fact yeah yeah, yeah. um well for me um I wanted to kind of give you the last word-ish uh, on, on this. Um, we've heard from Max and and Barnaby about, A, the importance of a wider and free-form debate about history and the, the, the force of the cultural restitution movement. Um, how can these two dynamics, the historical one, the cultural restitution one, be made, in your view, into a force for social and racial justice in, in this particular era we're in at the moment? Uh, just a very simple question to to end up the conversation. I'm, I've given up on expecting simple questions from you, Patrick. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so the, there's a lot, there's a few things I want to tease out. I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Um, it's funny, actually, that you asked me to comment on this. Um, so a few years ago, um, I started up um, an African cultural edutech heritage um, platform, and I held a series of roundtables of young African people across the diaspora. Um, and I went to um, the um, university set up by um, Kwame Nukrama in Ghana and met with um, Dr. Um, Professor Chikata out there who heads up the African History Department. And we spoke at length 
about, you know, the issues going on here because my proposition was, well, the we, you know, and using my finance head at the time, I said, we want foreign currency, you know, um, we're relying on remittances and remittances and, you know, bonds at ridiculous interest rates, right, um, that is heavily indebting us. Well, we need to, how about we build our tourism um, and, you know, we invest in having these museums and bringing back all of these artifacts and making sure that the money comes, you know, to Africa as opposed to, you know, the Lord knows how much billions of money, um, you know, these um, Western um, museums have been able to extract out of, um, you know, our artifacts. Um, and, you know, it was very interesting as we had those conversations. Um, and the person who made me think the most was um, a girl called Shabindu, um, who is an author who wrote Welcome to Lagos. Um, and what she said mm. is, why are you suggesting we do to ourselves exactly what they did to us? Museums are literally built out of um, demonstrating colonial power. That was the whole point of them. The very institution um, is this idea that um, it's demonstrating its power and it's filled to the brim. I mean, there's Nigeria is just one place where things have been stolen or, you know, artifacts have been taken, but it's a projection of power, right? Um, and um, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very key part of, you know, um, the very idea of, um, you know, their sense of having this geopolitical power to almost on one hand say, we're sorry, well, if you get a sorry, um, or some sort of backhanded acknowledgement that, yeah, 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 we did something wrong, sorry. But, but on the other hand, yeah. having these humongous monuments to, like, praise all the awful things they did and charge people for it and insist we can't possibly give it back because you guys don't know how to take the care of the things that we stole from you, you know? You need to improve your infrastructure uh, as if <laughs> as if they didn't destroy it in the first place and don't continue to be... Um, party to the destruction of um, the environments out there. And the point that Professor Chikata made was that um, completely, you're right, a lot of, um, you know, these artifacts are held in the hands of individuals and not just of individuals abroad, like individuals in Nigeria as well, who, um, you know, would um, sell these things, um, you know, because they felt like, oh, well, we don't see any particular value in it. And I think that speaks again to something that I just wanted to tease out a bit of what Max was saying in terms of this sense that a lot of Nigerians kind of feel like, you know, before the British came, you know, we weren't really doing anything. I actually think what's happening there just from at least through the, the black monologues and interviewing people around this. And I've had interviews with my great, uncle, for example, who was one of the first Nigerian students to be flown over to study at, at McGill when he was like 16 and was part of, you know, sort of pushing for Nigerian independence and all of these things. And we spoke at length about um, history. Um, and he said, well, the problem was, is that you have people like him who are very smart, um, and, you know, were part of the brain drain or what have you, but were actively sort of pushing for, um, you know, decolonization and independence and all of these things. But at the same time, you had these powerful elites who were in cahoots with the Brits, right, who had a vested interest in also pushing this idea that British presence was good for us. And they their generations inherited down that sense as well. So I see a humongous class divide. So amongst like the bourgeois of Lagos elite, right? Or like the affluent Nigerian cities, there's this sense of, oh, we weren't really doing anything. Blah, 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 blah. It's all easy for them to say, well, they have <laughs> their property in St. John's Wood, <laughs> and, like their or part and parties for the system, right? Um, but when it comes to, you know, the Nigerians who 
were sort of, you know, and to, to, to Max's point, people like Fella, you know, who are humongous projections of the sense of what it is to be Nigerian and history through his music that had a global, um, you know, projection and, you know, it was a complete, you know, Fella completely embraced his sense of being Nigerian, even though he studied abroad as well. And even though he came from an elite background, but he actually came from an academic, a more academic, more politically, um, so, you know, as you know, with his mother, for example, I think she was one of the um, first educated um, women um, what one of the first women to go to university in Nigeria, if I remember, remember correctly. And you had this whole, you know, you had the Wale Shoyinkas, the Chino Achebes, like they were there, you know. And even if you look at Francophone um, Africa, you had, you know, all sorts of, um, 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 you know, um, thinking coming out of this sense of our history and trying to um, combat this narrative that was being pushed amongst European academic circles. Um, But they, and it still happens today, could find, you know, and this is where class then becomes something that unites people at this top, at the elite sort of space. Then you had these super elite, (laughs) wealthy Africans, um, and they're not always politicians, to be honest. I feel like a lot of politicians don't, um, come from that sort of background. They're industrialists and they sort of worked as sort of, um, you know, they worked in cahoots with the Brits, right? Um, those or any other colonial power, depending on the nation, those guys and the, the descendants of them who, you know, many of them are my peers and will openly talk about it, will say, you know, we were taught that because to justify the wealth that they have today and to um, absolve themselves of taking any responsibility in their part to play. Um, you know, they're taught this revisionist sense that, um, you know, well, actually colonialism brought us faith and colonialism brought us development and it did all of these good things for us, right? But if you talk to other people who aren't don't have those same vested interests, there is a very strong sense of history and culture and there is a very strong sense of being proud about that you know, and talking about it and being open about it. And it's extremely powerful. You know, I think sometimes we get so caught up on that very loud bourgeois, we forget that there are millions and millions and millions of people in Nigeria, right? Um, And Chibundu also made a very good point of saying that actually the thing that we have been passing down consistently, aside from oral history, is festivals, and celebrating the history of our culture via festivals. And she said, we focus so much on creating this building and putting it behind like glass, you know, or perspex or whatever, and putting a little blurb and saying, we found this in X place at X date or whatever, um, which doesn't really speak to our, you know, indigenous cultures. If we're really talking about doing something that is more grounded in our indigenous cultures, then you need to look at those cultures and how they have traditionally celebrated their history, right? And how it can be part of ceremony as well. So for example, you know, in Yoruba weddings, there's a very particular way in which they are done. There's history in that. There are people who have written about it as well, but it's the continuance of it and the development of it that is more special and important to them. So just Hopefully, as a concluding point, I think we just need to sort of be careful when we say it would be an amazing thing. Um, And not to, because I completely understand with um, what you're saying, Barnaby, that intentions are good, right? But sometimes, you know, the way to hell is paved with good intentions at times. Um, And I think that we need to do even more work where we start to think, okay, well, actually, we need to ask the people what they want, right? So, yes, the, you know, I mean, the Oba and what have you, um, I'm not going to say anything because um, I have too much proximity to those people. But, like, you know, they they have a certain vested interest, and I agree with you, and there are, you know, power dynamics going on there, but they are, again, part of the bourgeois. They're not the people. Um, you know, that's not where the centre of history and culture is 
lies and so I think there has to be more and at least that's what I'm trying to do is projecting more their voices and how they feel because they're just as valid and there's much more of them. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast and a special thanks again to our guests. That's Max Cillian, Barnaby Phillips, and Funmi Adebayo. You can always catch our previous podcasts and all our features online at theafricareport.com. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, do rate and review us on your favorite platform. For The Africa Report, this is Anne-Marie Bassada. Thanks for listening.